And so uh, now what I think I want to do is, as we're going through Sri Aurobindo's Life Divine, and there's still quite a ways to go through, I want to do a parallel stream on Arthur Young's book, The Reflexive Universe, which is a subtitled uh, Evolution of Consciousness. Um, we've already brought it up a few times, uh, because I think that uh, with Young, Young was a scientist and an engineer. He invented the Bell helicopter, the famous helicopter that you see at the beginning of each episode of MASH. That was his invention. Uh, so he comes out of a background in the hard sciences, but he was also a spiritual individual, although nowhere near the level of Sri Aurobindo um, or Rudolf Steiner or anything like that. But he had a very concrete knowledge of the sciences, which I like um, to go through to fill in the sort of gaps because Aurobindo doesn't have Arthur Young's grasp of Western science. Arthur Young doesn't have Aurobindo's spiritual sophistication, not even by a long shot. But nonetheless, there are some interesting similarities, and the upshot of both models is pretty much basically the same. Um, Young was into mythology, and he was into astrology. He wrote uh, uh, an autobiography where he keeps track of all of his astrological transits. Um, so he's a huge fan of astrology. He was born in 1905, lived all the way into his 90s. He had a nice long life. Um, and so that's, in a nutshell, just briefly who, who he is, or who he was. And... Um, so, let's take a look. So, he has this idea that um, he's basically taken the Gnostic myth, uh, but it's common to not just Gnosticism, as we'll see, a, a bunch of different myths, of the fall, sinking, and capture of light, or the soul, and or the soul, as it falls and descends into matter, and then has to find its way back out again to its original origins. That's the common myth in uh, Gnosticism. And I want to go over the Manichaean creation myth uh, here in a minute uh, as, a, as a perfect analog of what he's doing, looking at the uh, entire uh, overview of the sciences, which he divides into seven distinct levels. And these levels move, uh, let's say the, the descent is from light to subatomic particles, to atoms, to molecules, which is the nadir, the absolute fall, then up to plants, then animals, and then human consciousness. And by human consciousness, he really means the higher human consciousness, the Buddha, Zoroaster, the Christ, the big guys, um, who liberate light uh, th through their consciousness and through transformations of consciousness. Um, but so in this first chapter, um, he gives that list and he says, notice that the first thing about that is that it's cumulative. Um, as it descends, uh, it's cumulative. Molecules have atoms in them. Uh, living things have molecules in them. Um, uh, atoms have subatomic particles in them. Subatomic particles have light in them, and so forth. So it's cumulative. Each step in the, each next phase in evolution takes up everything that has happened before it and then folds it in and takes it into account. And so that's point number one. So chapter number one is called The Fall. And so, uh, the, his idea of the fall, let's take a look at his, uh, the first diagram here um, that shows his v, the V-shaped version of his fall, um, where we have, um, at the top left there, we have light, and he ascribes uh, to each one of these domains a particular adjective describing it. Light, light is the realm of potential, potentiality, um, and it has three degrees of freedom, so it has the maximum amount of freedom. And then the next level down is uh, substance, which are subatomic particles. They've lost one degree of freedom. Light has been captured already in electrons and protons, which have electrical charges. And then uh, in the next level down, we have atoms. Uh, form is one word, but another word he uses there is identity, because each of the atoms on the periodic table of elements has its own identity. So there's been another loss of a degree of freedom there. So now we're down to one degree of freedom, and then atoms are taken up and organized down at the bottom there into molecular structures, which is formed substance or combinations. Zero degrees of freedom. This is the absolute fall, the nadir and capture of light. It's false sinking and capture into matter, uh, where we have determinism, complete Newtonian uh, determinism. And then uh, as life begins to come in, on the right side there with plants, we retrieve a degree of freedom. Plants have one degree of freedom. They grow vertically, uh, so we have organization. And then in the next one above it, we have 
mobility, freedom of mobility through space with animals, which reattains the two degrees of freedom that subatomic particles had, and then with dominion, which is the human world of human transformations of consciousness. Let's say Gene Gebser's history of the of the, uh, the the different five stages of consciousness, from the archaic to the magical to the mythical to the mental to uh, mental to the integral. Um, that's the realm of the liberation of light and the absolute freedom. Human consciousness has as much freedom uh, as light does, and you might even describe yoga as transformations of the inner light, as I've heard it uh, described. So that's the arc, um, and um, so then. He also has, uh, let's see here. A much larger grid-shaped version here. Um, and the grid-shaped version. Um, let's transition it here without the underlying. Okay, so the grid-shaped version, we've got seven levels going down and seven going across because each of the domains each one of them recapitulates the seven transformations on its own level. So at the top there we have light uh, going across with its seven transformations, cosmic rays, then x-rays, uh, the, uh, gamma rays, or gamma rays, x-rays, visible light, microwaves, uh, UHF rays, and then long wave uh, radio waves. And then at the second level, at the level of binding, we move from the potential domain of light to the binding, the beginnings of the loss of light's freedom. Um, he doesn't list any of the subatomic particles there. Um, for what reason, I'm not yet sure. Uh, and then down below that, we have um, identity, where atoms then begin to take up subatomic particles and light um, to create the periodic table of the, ele uh, of the elements that goes across here. And then below that, we have another level, which is the level, uh, which is the nadir. This would correspond to the, the nadir of the V in the previous diagram, where we have complete capture, zero degrees of freedom in the molecular realm with metals and salts and non-functional compounds and functional compounds, polymers, polymers with side chains, and then DNA. Um, and then the next level down, then we have life and the, the reattainment of one degree of freedom, uh, starting with uh, uh, bacteria and then algae moving along with more and more cells, single, uh, with solenerous, uh, single organ uh, beings, uh, silophyte tails, um, calamites, trees, and ultimately then flowers. And then below that we have animals, starting with uh, single celled animals, moving up to multiple celled animals like sponges. And then here we have solenerates, not solenerates, the, the other one above was uh, a different one. It's hard to read on this uh, a small uh, diagram here. And then uh, multiple animals with multiple organs like mollusks and so forth and then the chain uh, principle with uh, annelids worms re recapitulate the polymerization principle uh, and then chains with side chains like arthropods and then finally vertebrates and then at the bottom then we have the level of dominion which is the realm of uh, human transformations through culture which he leaves rather vague and should be filled in I think uh, with Gene Gebser. Uh, and his transformations of consciousness. So those are the two models that he gives. Um, and so this uh, second chapter then, uh, he talks about his idea of light as purposive and why he thinks light is first cause of all of this. Light for him is purposive. And he points out a couple of interesting things about light. First of all, we know that light travels um, 186,000 miles per second and that it has no mass. It also has no charge and time and space do not exist for it. Uh, as Einstein points out, if an object, any, any object uh, other than light, which is the only, a photon is the only thing that has no mass, um, were to travel at the speed of light, time for it would stop, space would collapse into two-dimensionality, and it would gain infinite mass, which for a physical object is impossible. And so light is a bit of a mystery. Uh, no time, no space, no charge, and it has constant velocity. That is to say, it's, it's never at rest. It's always going. Um, and so that's the first thing that he points out about it. And the theory of light has gone through, Newton originally thought that it was corpuscular. He was, of course, wrong about that. Huygens, shortly after him, suggest, was the first to suggest that life would, light was propagated in concentric waves. But those concentric waves required a medium, which later in the 19th century becomes this hypothetical idea of ether, but in order for light to pro propagate at that speed, 
through a medium like that, it would have to have had the rigidity even more than steel. So that was discarded because it was still bound. Note that it was still bound, as Young points out, to materiality. And there's nothing material about light. Um, and then, so Planck was the one who then comes along with his idea, the correct idea, that unlike atoms, let's say atoms are quanta of substance. They're units of substantiality. They have mass and they're subatomic particles. Uh, the electrons and protons have mass and electrical charges. Uh, light doesn't have any of that. And so for Planck, light, light is propagated as a quantum of action. Uh, so it's a quantum of action, not of mass. So that's what it is. It moves uh, in whole packets, quanta, but uh, photons, in other words, but they have no mass. Um, and then for Young, light is purposive because it always takes the path of uh, least resistance in the sense that um, it takes the, it follows the route that will take it the shortest amount of time to get to where it wants to go. And as far as Arthur Young is concerned, that indicates that light has purpose. Uh, he doesn't exactly say that it's conscious. And note too here, and this is an important uh, analog to Sri Aurobindo's idea, that within Arthur Young's system, light functions in his system the way consciousness with a capital C, Satchitananda, functions in Aurobindo's system. Uh, both sy systems represent the fall of consciousness in Aurobindo into matter as it involves and involutes itself in matter Whereas in Young's system, it's light that uh, falls. It's purposive. He doesn't say it's conscious, but it's purposive, and it falls into matter. So they're equivalent ideas homologously, but not analogously, because obviously light is, it is still within the material realm. It's not just pure spirit the way Aurobindo's consciousness is. Um, and so that's the principle of least action. And the principle of least action then gives to light its purposiveness for Arthur Young. And the other thing about light too is that as its weight, as it gets small, as its quanta get of action gets smaller, let's say as the wavelengths get smaller, it actually has more energy. Uh, it gains more energy uh, as it gets smaller. Whereas uh, for physical matter, the smaller physical matter gets, the less energy it has. Um, so that's the comparison with the, so that's light uh which is the first level of his sevenfold chain of being um representing the principle of absolute freedom and it gets caught captured and ultimately eventually liberated through living things and so uh young's model does follow the same basic outline as orobindo's as we have said in the orobindo videos if you've been watching them from matter uh to life to mind um but i like uh, illustrating Aurobindo with Arthur Young's model to because he's got all these uh, per particularizations. Now I just want to conclude this introduction then to Arthur Young by talking about an analog uh, because he was fully aware that he was drawing an analog to the mythology of the fall, the myths of the fall, especially the fall of some cosmic being into matter. And the Monachian creation myth is the one that reminds me of, of uh, his the most here. Mani was uh, a prophet who lived something in the third century, 216 maybe to 277 AD. Uh, and I have a map here of the distribution of Manichaeanism, which was quite extensive. It, is, it arisen, originated in, uh, in Persia there. You can see Mani there in the middle of mid-century uh, and it's propagated through the Sassanid Empire on up into China with the Uyghurs and then over into North China south china and then west uh, all across the mediterranean basin there so it, it had it gave christianity a run for its money as uh, a possible world religion and one of the reasons for that was because of its syncretism because mani um had a positive attitude both toward buddhism on the one hand and christianity on the other and uh, in the, the gospel of john christ says i will send you another after i'm gone a paraclete a comforter um, and there were various individuals after him, uh, I think Marcion might have been one of them, who proclaimed themselves as the, as the paraclete. But Mani proclaimed himself as the paraclete, the one who had something to say by fusing together Zoroastrianism, Buddhism, and Christianity with his own unique blend of it. I think his religion resembles Zoroastrianism more than it does uh, anything else. So that's the distribution of it. So let's take a look at the myth of it. Um, and let's see, let's 
give you this image to chew on while, while we're going through it. Um, this is Giovanni uh, uh, Porta's image of hell, but it fits the myth perfectly. So as the myth goes, in the beginning, there are two separate realms, a realm of light and a realm of darkness. And the realm of light is ruled by a, a king of light, a god of light. And then there is an evil one, an antagonist in the realm of darkness, who has an army of demons. And he's, de he's deciding that he's going to launch an attack on that realm. And so um, the king of light has a consort, Sophia. And to preempt that attack, he has Sophia... Uh, create a being called the Anthropos and the Anthropos is suited up in an armor of light and he is sent down into the realm of darkness to do battle with these demons but he loses they rip off his armor of light and they eat it so this is how light then falls into the realm of darkness so they eat it and he has to be rescued by another being the Holy Spirit the Holy Spirit has to come down reach his hand down and he pulls uh, the Anthropos Anthropos back up to the realm of light to rescue him. Meanwhile now, the Holy Spirit takes on the role of the Demiurge and decides to create the universe out of the dead bodies of the demons that were slain during this battle with the Anthropos. But remember that they have particles of light within them. So as he is creating the sun, moon, and stars, and the physical world, everything has light trapped inside of it. That's the key thing to think about. And so as he's going across the sky in his moon boat, there's a group of male demons who look up and see him as a beautiful woman and they masturbate and they ejaculate and they ejaculate onto the ground and from out of that ejaculation springs up plants. And the Manichaeans have this idea that the particles of light are propagated through semen. And this is why <clears throat> St. Augustine, who began as a Manichaean, uh, why it was so important for him uh, in rejecting Manichaeanism to uphold the idea uh, that Christ was born of a virgin, so that that semen wasn't transmitted with original sin in his case. He had to be born pure, exempt from the chain of this Monarchian trapping of light. And so uh, the female demons, meanwhile, look up and they see him as an Adonis figure, which causes them to spontaneously give birth to all these monsters and demons that then find the plants that have grown up with high concentrations of particles of light in them because uh, fruits and vegetables for Monarchians have very high concentrations of light particles within them and they crawl over and start gobbling these down. Uh, so now the light has fallen even further down into these creatures that the, uh, the female demons have given birth to. But now they decide that since they have all this light down here, uh, they don't want it taken away from them by the powers of light, so they decide to create uh, a couple, a pair, uh, that will embody the highest concentrations of light particles, namely Adam and Eve. So what they do is they carve up these beings, these monsters who have eaten all the plants containing all the light. So they carve them up, they eat them, and then they propagate and produce Adam and Eve, who come all the way at the end of this tradition of the fall as vessels of perfection containing the highest concentrations of light particles in creation. And then at the end of, for, for Mani, at the end of creation, all the light particles eventually, uh, they, they fill up on a monthly basis because it's the job of the Manichaean electi um, who do not engage in sexual intercourse. The, the inner circle do not. The outer circle can, but not the inner circle. Um, and they're vegetarian. They liberate particles of light, and those particles of light travel up to the moon every month, fill the moon, and then when there's a full moon, the light particles are then transmitted to the sun. Because what we are doing here is that at the end of time, all the light will be extracted from matter, gathered back up to create that original armor of light that the Anthropos wore in the beginning and that fell. Now, you can't get uh, a better analog uh, than that for Arthur Young's uh, process philosophy. It's, it fits it to a T. It's absolutely perfect. Um, you get the fall of light uh, into matter. Um, you get the creation of uh, plants and animals that are, have also gobbled up the light and are trying to liberate it by creating human beings, Adam and Eve, representing the liberation of light uh, through the dominion level of human consciousness. So it's amazing how Arthur Young was being an engineer, and you wouldn't expect this kind of intuitive, mythological, poetic brilliance from, from the mind of a, of a left-brainer like that. But nonetheless, uh, for him to perceive that, these kinds of myths of the fall sinking capture of light and its redemption and then to take the entire 
knowledge that we have of science uh, and show that the whole thing is actually physically, literally doing the same exact thing is, is, is a stroke of, of genius, to, uh, to say the least. So, uh, so that's, those are the first couple of chapters of the Reflexive Universe. And uh, next uh, we'll continue with, uh, I think Adams is, is going to be the next main chapter after his outline of the fall.